from the kingdom of Ohio. This is O'Culture, transmitting conversations on esoteric art, science, and history at 528 hertz. I'm your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thank you for choosing to spend your time here with us. And thank you to our new subscribers in Ireland, Germany, and Switzerland. I've not been to your countries, but I am a fan of your whiskey, schnitzel, and chocolate. Or maybe I just like food and beverages in general. Hard to say. Either way, I appreciate your support. In this episode, I'm chatting with author Tony Kale. Tony has a new book out called A Secret History of Memphis Hoodoo, which examines the impact of hoodoo culture in the Memphis area. We'll talk some hoodoo in general, its roots in Africa, and how it impacted culture in the Mid-South of the United States. Tony Kale is an ethnographer and writer. He holds a degree in cultural anthropology and has researched magical religious cultures for more than 25 years. His work has taken him from voodoo ceremonies in New Orleans to Haitian botanicas in Harlem and spiritual churches in East Africa. He's lectured at more than 100 universities, hospitals, and public safety agencies and has been featured on CNN Online, The History Channel, and numerous radio, television, and print outlets. To be honest, I wasn't too familiar with Hoodoo specifically before reading Tony's book, but I think I held my own here and our conversation turned out to be quite enjoyable. It's one of those where I learned quite a bit about something that, again, I was unfamiliar with before we spoke. I hope you feel the same way as you're listening to it. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Tony Kale. Enjoy! So Tony Kale, thanks for being here. Hey, thanks for having me. Hey, no problem, man. I'm really interested in why people chose the path that they did in their life. So I guess a good place to really start is with you and how you became interested in ethnography to begin with. Years ago, I actually started doing work in researching uh, various world cultures. Where we live here in the South, we're in the area that's, that's commonly known as the Bible Belt. And growing up in Western Tennessee, anything that was non-Judeo-Christian, non-Southern Baptist was deemed many times devil worship or, or paganism or things that were just unconventional. So I began a study of, of different cultures, and it, it fascinated me throughout the years how the, the dynamics that practitioners of different magical religious faiths faced in areas like the South, uh, where certain practices had to be practiced in secret, uh, where materials and artifacts might be difficult to attain because of the region. So over over time, I started doing some work with law enforcement and public safety agencies in explaining what a lot of this meant, because in the beginning, uh, a lot of this a lot of these cultures were viewed primarily by police and public safety groups as, as all being some sort of deviant activity, always connected to some sort of criminal activity. And so over time, I, I had sort of what I, I guess has become, personally, I, I call it the, the Fernando Ortiz effect. Fernando Ortiz was a, a criminologist in Cuba who... Uh, his work initially focused on what was perceived as criminal activities by Afro-Caribbean-based groups. And so he, he became very focused. He, he wrote on these particular practices, the illegal acts that were going on with, with some of the different groups. But as time went on, he started discovering that there was a rich culture that that had some very valid philosophies, some some very intricate philosophies that that he actually started trying to learn a little bit more about, and he eventually became known as the the father of Afro Cuban studies. So he had this this great paradigm shift uh, as he started studying some of the different groups, and I I feel like over time that's that's what happened with me. Uh, I had this paradigm shift and understanding that uh, the majority of magical religious groups, uh, particularly here in the U.S., aren't involved in any kind of criminal activity and that there are typically deviants who uh, will take the name of a religion, regardless if it's Christianity or paganism, and, and will use it for their own selfish means. So it's not, not the religious culture's fault. And then over time, too, uh, as sort of a, another track of my life, at a young age, I started hearing 
uh, about elements of hoodoo. We, as a child, lived in Memphis and uh, would would visit places like A. Schwab, which was a uh, uh, a dry goods store on Bill Street. It's one of the oldest businesses left in Memphis. And they carried curios, candles, powders, and oils, things like that. And I remember as a child uh, seeing that and, and kind of being curious about what that was. And years later, I would come to meet a, a lady here locally uh, who was a root worker and would spend some time with her in trying to understand what exactly she did. And a few years later, I uh, actually had the opportunity to do some work in East Africa and during that time saw some practices uh, there in Africa that uh, were very reminiscent of some of the practices here in the, the area that I grew up around. And so these these all these worlds kind of converged and uh, anthropology was definitely an area that provided sort of an academic structure in understanding uh, these different practices and, and how they came to be and how they function. And so uh, that's that's sort of where we're at today. Okay. So what specifically is African hoodoo? Where did it come from? And how is it similar to or different from things like, you know, Afro-Caribbean voodoo or Nigerian juju or some other similar sounding cultures, I guess? You know, all these particular cultures are, are branches from the same tree, and, and that tree is Africa. And all of these different African traditional religions have a lot of commonalities among them. You may take the uh, Ifa practices of the Yoruba, uh, you may take the, uh, the practices of the uh, Bakongo people, uh, you may even take the different practices of traditional healers among Um, South Africans and uh, and among Zulu. But we find that that a lot of these traditions changed and and adapted according to uh, where they migrated to. And and when we look at hoodoo, we see strains of these religions. Now, hoodoo itself is, is a practice. It's not a religion. When we talk about voodoo, voodoo is a religion. Voodoo has a, a pantheon of deities. The, uh, the Loa are, are deities and, and spirits of nature. Hoodoo does not have a, a concrete belief system or, or any sort of set ideology. And hoodoo is, is sort of the, the repackaging of these African practices that came out of Africa. The, the way they ended here, uh, ended up here was through slavery. And many times slaves were forced to give up their religious practices that they grew up with. They were forced to give up the traditional ways that they were taught to, to live and to serve deities. And so here in the new world, many of these practices uh, were continued in secret. And on some plantations, some of these cultures were met with Protestant Judeo-Christianity. And so we started seeing um, this combination of, of elements. You might have a, a African traditional practice in regards to, say, um, offering sacrifices uh, or offering prayers or divination. And then you might see elements of Protestant Judeo-Christianity, such as reading of the Psalms or, or reading of the Lord's Prayer, different elements of scripture used in concert with these Africa, African traditional religious practices. And so... Hoodoo itself is, it's, it's more of a set of practices. It's kind of a blanket term for those traditions that survive. Now, now let me say this. When we talk about uh, the Memphis and, and Delta region, hoodoo in, in our region is going to be different than hoodoo in the Carolinas. It's going to be different than hoodoo in the mountains of Kentucky. It's going to be different than hoodoo in uh, different areas of the country where there's more of an influence of, of Dutch and Germanic practices, uh, a lot of heavy Native American practices. And although we did see some Native American practices in, in Mississippi, and, and they did affect some of the practices we saw historically in Memphis as well, but primarily the practices uh, appear to be 
uh, of African origin. So what are some of these traditional elements of hoodoo? One of the the common elements is, uh, and these are all common elements we see in African traditional religions. And, And the African traditional religions are those indigenous practices of the different ethnic groups in Africa. One common element that we we see in African traditional religions that we also see in hoodoo is belief in a supreme being. When I was in East Africa, you would have uh, one particular people group speak of the Ngai. The Kikuyu people would talk about Ngai. Uh, There was also a group that talked about a supreme deity known as Inyasai among the Bakongo there's uh, in Sambi. And so the, the name changes, but there is still a recognition of a supreme being. Now, also very profound or, or very uh, profound amongst African traditional religions is we see the, the reverence towards spirits of the dead, primarily ancestors. And we hear a lot of, uh, we, we, we hear a lot of reference in Western material to what they call ancestor worship. This is really a misnomer. Uh, it's not necessarily worship ancestors as it is just venerating and considering uh, the power and the wisdom of ancestors. And we see this practice filtered down into hoodoo. We see the reverence of ancestors. Uh, there may be seance type practices. Uh, we see the use of things like graveyard dust and coffin nails and the the reverence of of items from the graveyard because uh, the graveyard is the home to the dead. And so we see a lot of parallels there. We also see a lot of parallels between the use of herbs in African religion and the use of herbs in hoodoo. And herbs are recognized not only for their medicinal properties, but for their magical properties as well. And uh, so we, we see that. We also see a lot of parallels with African traditional religions and the use of amulets or charms. You know, we can look to the Bakongo people of Africa uh, where they would use figures that they, they called minkisi, which were typically a, a uh, statue form of a, of a person or, or a personality that had various herbs and various materials placed inside of it. Uh, by a traditional ritual specialist. And this particular item could serve as a a charm or an amulet that emitted energy and and could be used to either attack enemies or protect a village. And we saw a lot of these same principles duplicated or strained into hoodoo uh, with the use of elements like the mojo bag. You know, the mojo bag follows that same principle. We're taking material objects and infusing them with spirit to be able to uh, emit a certain energy to be able to be used for protection. Uh, In some cases, uh, maybe forms of aggressive magic or or in uses related to love or luck. And so we do see a lot of parallels between these practices in African traditional religions and contemporary American hoodoo. I have maybe a a tongue-in-cheek sort of question here, but you mentioned the mojo bag. And for people that, you know, might not know what that is, but they might know the term mojo in terms of, like, an energetic way, maybe? Like, I lost my mojo? Yeah. Is that where it comes from? Well, yeah, that's, you know, we we hear it referred to in pop culture. I know that the, uh, you know, there was a a number of, of comedy movies where they referred to that someone's, you know, their, their mojo was working good or, you know, they lost their mojo. This, this is a reference to that loosely, but when we talk about mojo in hoodoo, um, the, the term it's believed to have originated from a specific African term typically called muyu and which, which basically referred to the soul of a person and that this particular uh, soul or spirit could be placed in an item like a bag. And so uh, we, we see that inference in hoodoo through the use of, of a mojo bag. And um, that's, again, it's, it's basically a, 
a packet or a, a, a series of materials that are charged or infused with spirit to be able to act and, and to basically become alive. Yeah, you know, I <laughs> when I was reading through there, I I just I couldn't help but think of that, you know. So my apology for maybe going a little too tongue in cheek with that, but I also want to go back to the power of herbs. Uh, you have a great quote in here from a West African healer, uh, Maladum Patrice Somme. Is that how you would say it? Yes. So you have a a great quote in here from him that says. Uh, this means that within nature, within the natural world, are all of the materials and tenets needed for healing human beings. Nature is the textbook for those who care to study it and the storehouse of remedies for human ills. And I, I was glad to see that in there because I've thought this for a long time just in my own mind, and I, I probably told a few people this too, but I've always thought that, that everything we needed to survive was already here for us. We don't need to go into laboratories to make pharmaceuticals to heal us, for example. We, we have everything we need in nature. Obviously, people that are practicing hoodoo are well aware of this, right? Absolutely. You know, when we talk about hoodoo, many times in, in pop culture, hoodoo is typically, the, the, the focus is typically on mojo bags and black cat bones and, and um, basically forms of conjure, to be more specific. But the element of root working in hoodoo is, is really what's paramount. And that particular use, that tradition of using herbs as healing elements, it can definitely not only be traced back to Africa, but can see, be seen in a number of, of world cultures. I mean, a number of the Asian cultures have some amazing examples of the use of herbs for healing and, and for prevention of disease. One of the things that I, I thought was really interesting was when we were doing research on the book, there was a, uh, a, a, a actually a few epidemics of yellow fever in Memphis. And at one point, the epidemics were so bad that they uh, were actually piling bodies up in the streets. And they said it was nothing for there to be, you know, 200 bodies out in the street on a given day. And uh, many people fled Memphis during this horrible epidemic. But one of the things that was interesting that we found in, in some of the older literature was that some of the same herbal remedies that hoodoo practitioners, that root workers in Memphis had been persecuted for using and, and called superstitious for their belief in, in the effect of these herbs, that these same herbs were now being prescribed by remaining physicians in Memphis during the yellow fever. And you would see uh, different herbs and, and different uh, roots being used by physicians that were once just some very traditional herbs used by root workers on plantations in the Mid-South area. And, you know, on many of the plantations we saw we saw that there, there were just, of course, horrendous conditions. And, and on many of the plantations, slaves would, would uh, become sick and, and you would have some very unclean environments, unsanitary environments. So we had slaves who would get diseases. They'd get malaria and yellow fever. Um, and the unsanitary conditions many times led to sicknesses like dysentery and cholera. So many of these were treated with herbs by fellow slaves who who knew exactly what herbs to to take and in fact one of the earliest examples of root work that we we see historically in Memphis was back in the 1800s when we found evidence of where a a slave from the Carolinas came to Memphis uh, and was was put on a plantation and in his diary he writes of going out in the woods and getting herbs and roots and slippery elm bark to, to help other slaves who had become sick. Uh, so definitely, you know, the, the use of herbs is, is really paramount in the practice of, of hoodoo. Yeah, and you also mentioned that hoodoo practitioners themselves say that the use of herbs is based on some passages from the Bible too as well, right? There are some elements of of hoodoo where inferences to uh, biblical writings are mentioned. And uh, we, we've actually seen some examples through the years of where root workers might take examples from the Bible 
and scriptures from the Bible and put those with healing practices. So you, you see that there's not only a medicinal aspect to, to healing with roots, but there's also a, a spiritual component as well. You also mentioned one of the basic elements of hoodoo was cultural resistance. Could you talk about what that actually means? Sure. You know, the the term cultural resistance has been used to, to not only describe hoodoo and, and many of the, the African religious practices that, that were remaining during slavery, but actually it's also been used in describing African-American-based blues music because both of these elements provided almost a a magical therapy and a magical and philosophical resistance to the slave owners. You know, we can look even uh, around the world where there were situations in areas like Cuba where slaves that were being beat would take a small piece of wood, fashion it into a a doll or an image of a a man representing the, the slave driver. And they would whip this image with a whip or they would spit on it or they would attack it. And this was a way of magically getting back at the slave owner or the slave driver. And uh, this was uh, a form of cultural resistance. Also, hoodoo as a form of cultural resistance also appears on a level where the the slave is taught to uh, get rid of their old gods and and to follow this this new god and so the 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 practice the practice becomes a, a form of resistance i'd like to read this one one line from uh, historian michael harris uh, i thought this was was really nice he said here is the transplanted african learning to conjure with new roots new herbs and old meanings Here's that scorned, dark woman going into the woods, tearing off the burlap sack dress to clothe herself in the protective culture of her ancestral legacy. You know, the the practices of African spirituality, on the outside, surely the, the slave could be physically forced to give up visible signs of worship, but internally, those spiritual practices could and did go on. And uh, this very much became a form of, of cultural resistance. And and we see the evidence of that in that we still have hoodoo, that hoodoo lives. If it did not per- persist as this form of resistance through slavery and even later on through segregation, uh, we would not see hoodoo today. There's probably two or three threads in there that I want to pull on. And I think the first one is the magical practices in hoodoo. And there's two terms in the book specifically that I was interested in that I had never come across before. And I I want to know what the difference is between them. And it's uh, contagious magic and sympathetic magic. Could you talk about those? Sure. Contagious magic and sympathetic magic are basically two principles and two approaches to performing magic. And they're not just specifically in the realm of hoodoo. In fact, we can see these two variations throughout world religions that that have some sort of magical component. The basic principle is this, that magic works off of two philosophies, the law of contact and the law of similarity. The law of contact says essentially anything that has been in contact with someone can be used to affect that person. If you watched TV back in the 50s and 60s, you you would see Samantha the Witch maybe take a piece of hair from someone to use it in a spell. Why? Because the belief was that by affecting something that had been in contact with someone, it would still affect them. Uh, We see this in hoodoo, uh, in which a a conjurer may say, you know, get me me that person's socks. And I will put those socks on my altar, perform a ritual with them, and they will affect the owner of those socks. Now, the second philosophy of the law of similarity works on the premise that anything that is similar to someone or a thing will affect them. And so, you know, I might take someone's name and write it on a piece of paper and place it under a candle 
I might take a photograph of someone and perform uh, a ritual with it. And the belief is that by doing it with something that is similar to that person, it will affect that person uh, magically. And again, those, those two practices we, we've seen uh, in, in medieval uh, magical religious tr- traditions. And they can be seen uh, in everything from uh, Wicca to Santeria to Haitian voodoo. And, and those two concepts uh, can definitely be seen in hoodoo and conjure as well. Okay. We were talking about root working, you know, just a few minutes ago, and I wanted to know what the difference was or if there was a difference between a root worker, a spiritual doctor, and a conjurer, because those are terms that are used a lot throughout the book, and I, I don't know if they're interchangeable or if they're three separate disciplines. Well, you know, I, I, it, it really depends on who you ask and what region you're in. We Many times the word hoodoo is sort of used as a blanket term to refer to root workers, uh, to refer to conjurers, and to refer to, to spiritual doctors. Uh, typically, the, the big difference is that, that those that are considered root workers can practice what they practice without any form of, you know, necessarily um, aggressive or, or destructive magic. Conjurers are very much open to perform aggressive ritual practices and, and in some cases destructive ritual practices. One of the great anthropologists, Zora Neale Hurston, said that, uh, she said, nearly all of the conjure doctors practice roots but some of the root doctors are not hoodoo doctors. And you would hear, in the old days, you would hear the term uh, that someone worked either with two heads or both hands. And this basically meant that they were able to create charms with one hand and counteract charms with the right hand. And uh, they, you would hear even, there's even some reference in, in some of the older blues music to a woman with two heads. And this means that she could do good practices, types of root work, and also uh, what were considered a malevolent or aggressive practices as a conjurer. And then when we hear the word spiritualist, um, spiritualist is a, a more of a contemporary term. In fact, a lot of academics believe that what happened in the late 60s uh, and early 70s that hoodoo became such a stigmatized word that the word spiritualist uh, replaced the word hoodoo or or conjurer. And then we definitely saw a a number of practitioners of what would have been traditional hoodoo uh, become involved in some of the New Orleans spiritual churches and start calling themselves spiritualist. So we, we sort of see that as, again, just sort of a contemporary renaming of a root worker or, or a conjurer in some cases. Okay, so so root workers do left-hand work and right-hand work. Does that have any relation to the more occult magical terms of left-hand path and right-hand path? Well, now, the typical magical religious uh, or occult term of left-hand path, of, of course, is many times mentioned as referring to something that is uh, anti-establishment, many times anti-Christian, and and a lot of times referring to more European Satanism-based practices. Now, in the the hoodoo culture, when we talk about the left hand, the right hand, we're not talking about anything related to that particular area. What we're talking a little bit more closely about is the, the ability to create charms and the ability to um, get rid of charms as well. When we say the the individual who was two headed, that typically refers to someone that could do beneficial magic and also someone who could perform perhaps malevolent based aggressive magic. Yeah, doing a podcast like this, I come across you know Alistair Crowley a lot and uh, his left hand path. How did you describe that European Satanist? Yeah, typically we hear the the LHP or, or left hand path. Uh, used to reference European-based Satanism and a lot of times Luciferian-based religious practices. So uh, hoodoo 
has nothing to do with with Satanism. It's it's nowhere, uh, not 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 even in the same ballpark. It's a, something totally totally different. But I, I do understand what you're saying about those cultural terms sounding very similar as well, though. Well, you did mention earlier, too, that you worked with several local police departments, right? That you had to explain to them that this was not a threatening practice. And one of the other threads that I want to pull on here, and I'm going to quote a passage from the book and then I have a question about it, is you say that the artifacts and practices associated with hoodoo, conjure, and African-American folk magic gave many blacks in the South strength. This was a threat to the institution of slavery and racism, Spiritual strength provided the potential for an uprising among black communities in the southern U.S. So there's a lot of anecdotes in the book about police raids on hoodoo practitioners and establishments. And there does seem to be an indication that this was a purposeful, targeted effort and that there may have been even an underlying theme of people wanting to maybe stamp out African culture in the U.S., especially in the South. What do you make of this? Is there any validity to that? Oh, absolutely. You know, when we talk about the forms of resistance and, and rebellion in the, in the context of early South amidst slavery, when we look at a number of examples in history of events from the, the Haitian Revolution to many other events around the world where strength drawn from spiritual sources was used uh, is is a, a motivation and a form of of psychological and, and magical protection and striving forward in revolutions. Uh, we can definitely see that there there was a fear of power uh, among slaves that practiced some of these particular traditions. But I think even deeper, I, I think there was maybe less of a worry about slaves rising up and physically overtaking uh, a slave owner. As much as there was, there was this fear that by holding on to traditions, the slaves were not going to be broke down. The slaves were not going to be animals like slave owners portrayed them to be and and tried to make people into. And I I think it provided a a way of emotional and spiritual survival in in the midst of slavery and even later in the midst of, of segregation. You know, in Memphis, it, it's fascinating to see, starting back in the late 1800s, we find record where hoodoo and root work was mentioned in the local press. Uh, many times it would be mentioned as voodoo or pagan satanic rites. And there was this great fear that Africans and African Americans were, were bringing this scary demonic practice to America and uh, there was even public fears about, quote, voodoo practitioners going into to white people's homes and stealing their children and, and sacrificing their children. And all along, you, you, you see this building of this public fear toward these different religious cultures. And there came a point where police started physically taking artifacts from practitioners. There's a a famous incident that took place in a settlement in downtown Memphis that was called Rotten Row. And uh, it was sort of a mockery of an area that became famous in Memphis known as Cotton Row. But Rotten Row was commonly known as a Negro settlement by locals and there were constant raids on Rotten Row where African Americans were arrested. In many cases, they were arrested for not having a job. And uh, this was in a very you know, rough period in history where a lot of African Americans weren't able to get jobs. They weren't being offered jobs. And so we, we saw these particular incidences going on. And, and in one particular famous case, there was a, a root worker that had his, had his mojo bag taken from it. And, and it was taken by an officer and the officer lectured him on the, the superstitious beliefs that he was foolish for practicing. And then the bag uh, was burned in a, uh, in, in an incinerator and, and the, in a furnace. And basically the, the man who had it taken from him begged and said, please, you know, don't take this. This this protects me. This was just scratching the surface. Now, again, we're, we have to look at this in the cultural context 
of that period in history where there was a tremendous amount of racism, a tremendous amount of, of hatred. And we actually saw through the years a number of incidences where not just police, but, but public entities uh, were, were looking at root workers and in, in any kind of practitioners of African-American spirituality as, as these rebellious, unsafe individuals that threatened the existence of society. And we, we actually saw this through the years, even up until uh, the, the late 60s, uh, where we, we saw incidences where spiritual healers uh, were constantly being arrested for practicing medicine without a license, for issues related to fraud. Now, that's not to say that some of these incidences that Perhaps there were those that, that were breaking the law, and, and those are different situations. But we did find historically a number of incidences where practitioners, uh, particularly back in the, the late 1800s, all up until like the, the 1930s and 40s, were a primary focus uh, for arrest and harassment, uh, not only by the police, but, but the general public uh, at large. Yeah, but it seems like that a lot of white churches, for lack of a better term, picked up on a lot of these African religious practices after the slaves came over. You know, I'm talking about music and and ritual and things like that. So why were they targeting them, but then stealing their their mojo at the same time? That's a great question. You know, it's uh, it's it's sort of ironic during some of the work that the Reverend Harry Middleton Hyatt did in Memphis. Uh, Harry Hyatt was a Anglican minister who traveled around the United States studying folklore. He was actually a folklorist himself. And he began doing a lot of research on hoodoo and, and root work. And he actually visited Memphis because he said that uh, Memphis was an area that was really well known for having a, a large population of, of hoodoo and root work practitioners. But uh, when Hyatt came to Memphis back in, to, back in the, the late 30s or mid 30s, he started visiting the homes of different spiritual workers. One of the, the women that he visited was a lady named uh, Madam Collins. And Madam Collins shared with him that a good bit of her clients were from the white community. And she also told him that she she had to pay, just like many other spiritual healers at the time, had to pay a little bit of money to the police to keep them from arresting them, that there was sort of a payoff. And it was interesting to see that all during this time, you know, it was it was the black community that, that's filled with these alleged spiritual con people. And, you know, look at all this destructiveness that African Americans are causing. But yet there was a lot of the white community that were very quick to scoop up elements of African and African American culture. Uh, anything from food to music to, to even the use of, of African based spirituality. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's sort of like we, we want to call you the devil, but we, we definitely would like to borrow some of the things you have, you know? Well, yeah. So, and, uh, and there may be a connection here too, with the use of symbols as well, because there's a quote from a spiritual doctor, Washington Doc Harris in your book, who's also a Freemason, by the way. And he's talking about symbols and he says, quote, God told the black man and the Indian some things he didn't tell nobody else. And I'm thinking about this as you're talking, and I'm thinking of, you know, well, here's a black spiritual doctor who's obviously familiar with hoodoo. He's also a Freemason, and he's talking about the importance of symbols in these cultures. Is there a possibility that some of these old, rather white, secret societies took their symbolic and ritualistic practices from something like hoodoo or or from African religious practices in general? Well, you know, when we we look at what, we, we commonly refer to as secret societies that are European based and, and in many cases populated with, with whites. We see that there are elements that almost in all cases refer back to Egypt. And uh, we forget, contrary to popular culture, that Egypt is the, the elements of Africa in Egypt, the elements of African religion in Egypt, and the fact that 
Egyptians were were not shiny white Caucasians. And so we we see these elements of of symbols and sacred text and and rituals passed down. And again, going back to what we were initially talking about out of Africa, uh, there definitely could could be a tremendous amount of evidence that uh, that is the case, that there were a lot of elements taken from African culture. You know, you mentioned uh, Doc Harris, and Doc is mentioned in the book because one of the biggest phenomena in Memphis that in relation to African-American spirituality that uh, we, we have seen historically through the years focuses on a place near the Tennessee and Mississippi state border, a piece of, of property uh, where there's a, a small spiritual community that a family has on this property. Now, starting at a very young age in Memphis, you're, you're taught that as a teenager, uh, you can drive out to this property and and see all kinds of bizarre things, secret ceremonies, animal and human sacrifices, and that the, the piece of property is known as Voodoo Village. Well, the truth is th- there is no voodoo and there is no animal and human sacrifices going on. Uh, the, the property that was established by Wash Harris, uh, known as Doc Harris, is basically an area where his family owns, and they built uh, a number of structures and and buildings erected to God, and they have different elements of spirituality that each one of the buildings and symbols that are out there represent. Through the years, though, the community has been attacked. They've been vandalized. And and, and in fact, uh, Doc's son was telling me uh, a couple of months ago, he said, you know, since this place was erected in the 60s, we have not had one night of sound sleep. The place has been set fire. They've had Molotov cocktails thrown into it. Uh, people have rammed the fence. People have jumped over the fence. And, and the internet is filled with all sorts of urban legends and just indie made productions about this horrible thing that goes on at quote voodoo village. The, the community is actually known as the, the St. Paul's spiritual temple and wash Harris, doc Harris was not a hoodoo practitioner. Doc Harris spent a lot of times uh, taking hoodoo off of people. Uh, People would come to see him to have prayer, to have rituals performed to remove things that they believed had been placed on them. Uh, and, and through the years, he gained this reputation uh, as leading this, this voodoo cult out on the Tennessee and Mississippi border. And this is a, a perfect example of how, from the outside, things are, are uh, appear and, and on the outside. And, uh, but on the inside, the reality is something very different. And, you know, in, in anthropology, we're, we're taught that there are two perspectives— there's that outsider perspective that looks at things from the outside and make a judge j- makes a judgment call, and then there's the insider's perspective where where there's an understanding of what actually is going on uh, within a culture. Right, and speaking of that, that's a pretty nice segue to what I wanted to talk about next. Was that uh, speaking of how things appear? Let's talk about Memphis a little more, and specifically Beale Street. I've walked Beale Street a few times, but I never got the sense that it was a haven for hoodoo back in the day. What's the history of hoodoo on Beale Street specifically? Beale Street, uh, initially, in in its advent, was an area where African Americans could come and they could celebrate African American culture during a time of segregation. Uh, Robert Church was the South's first black millionaire. And Church invested a lot of money in Bill Street in the hopes of building it up to to basically be an area where African Americans could come and enjoy food and music and culture that that really was African American. And so, in the early days, you know, Bill Street had uh, some some really famous kitchens that that cooked you know some really really good foods. Um, You had uh, a lot of little blues juke joints up and down Bill Street where a number of historically significant blues musicians would would come and play. And you'd have everyone from, you know, B.B. King to Muddy Waters to uh, Lightning Hopkins. 
and, and you would have uh, these really big names play in Bill Street. That was the place to be. And you would also have African-American based medical treatment in the, in the form of uh, root work and hoodoo. And we know that back in the, uh, back in the forties, there were root workers on Beale. In fact, th- there was a, a period of time where Bill Street became such a hop in place for root work and hoodoo that physicians in the Memphis area complained publicly that they were losing clients and, and patients to these root workers on Bill Street. And, you know, it's it's very similar to how we see today with some of the, the Latin American community that utilizes the services of the curandero or the traditional Latin healers. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you find families that um, are comfortable with it because that's what they were raised around. And then also there's the element that those particular traditional healers not only address physical ailments, but also spiritual ailments. And this is something that the root worker and, and the, the uh, conjurer in many cases uh, could do. They could affect uh, the, the spiritual aspects of someone's life. They could uh, give them some sort of protection if someone had, had crossed them and, and put something on them. They, they not only were able to, to give you herbs to help your stomach, but also able to give you charms to help you gamble, to, to help your love life. And so, you know, we saw a, a lot of this uh, on early Bill Street. And, and through the years, uh, we started seeing businesses selling curios, such as candles and, and oils and powders and things for the hoodoo community uh, on Bill Street. Uh, at one time, a Schwab started, they, they carried so many hoodoo-related curios that, that, that there was a period of time that the family was sharing that they would move literally a couple of tons of candles in glass jars through a, a dumbwaiter through the bottom of their store to, to get it up to the floor of, of where they would put it on the counter. And they were moving this stuff on a regular basis. They, they would have people from all over the South come and, and get uh, different curios and, and items used in the practice of hoodoo. And there, there was even a time where on Bill Street, they, there were elements of, um, there, were, there were conjurers that got such a reputation around the Mid-South that we had um, gold miners that were coming off the Mississippi River and going into Bill Street and hiring some of these conjurers to help them locate gold. And so, you know, it, it, Bill Street definitely gained this reputation as being the street where you could find things. In fact, uh, there were even some references in, in local papers to Bill Street as the street of black magic, the black magic market in Memphis. So, and, and again, that's that's been many, many years ago. You know, today we, we have a few businesses left that, that still offer curios as sort of an homage to, to the early history there. But uh, it, it really was in its heyday in relation to hoodoo back in the 40s and around that time. Well, I don't know about the street of black magic. When I was there, it was more like the street of white drunkenness. But <laughs> I, 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 I might have been on the wrong stretch of Beale Street for the black magic. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's yeah, things have, have certainly, certainly changed. And, you know, not just on Beale, but throughout the, the, the city. And it's it's definitely a different world now. For sure, man. You did give me a good segue, though, because I got one more question for you. You mentioned that there was this unlikely marriage of hoodoo and gold digging or treasure hunting where people would employ conjurers to help them find gold. Well, that was a really cool anecdote from your book. And there are several great historical anecdotes from your book. Do you have any personal favorites? Well, you know, um, I'm always fascinated by one of the, the biggest historical incidences that happened in Memphis that really changed a lot of attitudes of, of Memphians during the period of segregation and involves a lady named Mary Grady uh, and a lady named Isabella Walton. Mary Grady was a white socialite who 
her and her husband owned a, a pool hall in Memphis. And uh, they, they made a decent amount of money. And Mary Grady fell in love with a gentleman who was an African-American taxi driver. The two had a relationship for a while, and and obviously during this time, a relationship like that, if there was anything done in the public eye, would definitely be uh, noteworthy to the general public because you just didn't see interracial romances out in the public eye at that time. The gentleman became very concerned for his safety because not only was he seeing a married woman, but he was seeing this socialite who was well-known in the community. So he disappeared. Well, Mary Grady decided to, uh, once she couldn't find him and he wasn't coming to see her anymore, she sought out the services of a a local root worker. And the root worker said that they had performed a ritual and that it was apparent that there was a woman who had stolen this man away. And the root worker identified a a young African-American lady named Isabella Walton. And so Grady decided to to go after Walton. Now, the root worker, it said, actually began collecting herbs and roots to perform some sort of magical working to counteract whatever had been put on uh, the cab driver to draw him away. But Mary Grady was more concerned about taking things in her own hands. And so Grady drove to Walton's residence and shot Walton in the head. This horrible act of violence was taken to court. Given the atmosphere at the time, Grady was not found guilty because the logic was, well, she didn't kill Walton, so there's no murder there. The general public had a a just a total reaction to this thing in which they were outraged, not because a a woman had been shot in the head, not because that this woman had been attacked as a result of, of a root worker can consulting the spiritual realm to, to, to find out about him, but because this was an interracial romance and that was so taboo. And it was interesting all the way up until this time, it was unheard of to hear of, non-African Americans in the Memphis community seeking the services of root workers. But once this situation happened, then it was recognized that, that, yeah, that was a reality. And, you know, again, it goes back to, we, we saw a particular segment of society ostracizing and attacking African Americans. And that same segment of society were quick, to try to gain the talents that, that that group, that that particular segment of society brought to the table. Uh, so again, it's just very much a, a reoccurring type action that we saw during this time of history. Absolutely, man. And I lied to you. I have one more question, if that's all right. Uh, sure. So what's the overall cultural impact that Hoodoo has had on the Memphis area one of the biggest things about this story that that has kept me really uh, just just uh, obsessed with this story is the fact that it's a story of survival. It's a story of persistence. And growing up in the Mid South, it's a story that we were never told. It's a story that many people in this area, black and white, have no idea happened. It's a story of of the good things and the evil things that have happened in this region of the world. But I think overall, it's it's a great story of survival and persistence in the face of violence, in the face of racism. I think that hoodoo has affected many different elements of Memphis. It's, you know, uh, you, you can hear it in the songs that were made famous on Bill Street. There are places in Memphis, you know, Memphis, and we we really didn't even get to get into this, but Memphis was home and still is home to some businesses that were some of the biggest businesses in manufacturing hoodoo-related curios that that were really well-known throughout the United States. Hoodoo has had a definite impact on Memphis, and there are so many 
historical landmarks and historical personalities that Hoodoo touched and that, that Hoodoo were, was part of, part of their lives. So it definitely, definitely had an effect on Memphis history. Is the impact still felt? Is it still practiced? It is still practiced. It's, um, you know, I, I, I always hate to, to mention this part, but a lot of the old guard, a lot of the elders are passing away. They've, they've gotten up in age. And sadly, we're seeing a lot of these traditions not being passed down orally. You know, I, I'm, I'm, finding it, I'm finding it fascinating that as I talk to some of the elderly uh, members of the African-American community in Memphis that, that are familiar with hoodoo and, and may even practice some of the elements of it, they, they refer to it, they refer to outsiders, uh, they refer it to outsiders as, you know, old, that old stuff. And nobody wants to hear about that old stuff. And um, it's, it's definitely still being practiced, not as much as it was years ago. And I, I think that part of the reason was it was very much a necessity back during the times of, of segregation and slavery. It was a, a form of cultural survival. There, there are still elements that you can see uh, if you know where to look in Memphis. And, and Memphis is definitely a, a, a city of, of stories and secrets that uh, are slowly unwinding every day. Well, yeah, and like you said, it, it is sad that, that the tradition hasn't been passed down orally. But I'll tell you what they need to do. They need to build an app and put it in the app store because then we could learn hoodoo on our phones, right? <laughs> there you go. So the book is A Secret History of Memphis Hoodoo. Tony, tell people where they can get the book and where they can keep up with you and your work. Well, the book, it is available through Amazon and History Press. You can find us online at memphishoodoo.com. And we also have information about a traveling museum uh, that we're putting together of hoodoo history at hoodoomuseum.com as well. Awesome. I I didn't know about that. What's going to be involved in that? Well, you know, during the research for this book, we, we continued finding artifacts and photographs and writings uh, related to the history of hoodoo in the mid south, and with so many uh, of these different things, you know, we thought, well, well, why not preserve them? We need to preserve them, and not only preserve them, but but use them to teach uh, about this this deep history, this deep culture that we have in this region. And so we we debuted the museum. Uh, a couple of weeks ago at the West Tennessee Delta Heritage Center and uh, had a, a, a really nice reception there. And um, we're, we're looking at using this uh, at different festivals, uh, at different schools and events, uh, and sharing a little bit about uh, the history of hoodoo and root working practices here in Memphis in the Mid-South. Hey, man, that's a really cool idea. I'm glad you're doing that. People should know, too, that when they pick up the book, they're not just going to read about the history of hoodoo in Memphis. They're going to see a lot of photographs in there, too, a lot of great photos that come from your collection and then from other places as well. So it's just a nice little feature, and I'm glad that you came on the show. I enjoyed the book. Best of luck with the book. Best of luck with the Traveling Museum. Thanks for your time. Thanks so much, Ryan. All right, there you have it. My thanks again to Tony Kale. He's at memphishoodoo.com. His book, A Secret History of Memphis Hoodoo, is available now. Links in the show notes per use. I'll tell you what stuck with me from this conversation. It wasn't something related to hoodoo specifically, but to culture in general. I see a lot of similarities between the slavery era in the U.S. and modern-day immigration in regards to the erosion of culture or the intentional erosion of culture. You heard Tony and I discussing the apparent need among slave owners to stamp out the spiritual belief system of the African people and then the targeted police raids of hoodoo practitioners and establishments in Memphis. And I can't help but wonder if that's not also what's going on across the world right now with the immigration and refugee narrative you see in mainstream media. I can't help but wonder if this isn't maybe just a covert way of doing the same thing. It's long been a tactic 
tactic of globalist types to intentionally displace and relocate people in an effort to erode their traditions and separate them from their cultural identity and force them to assimilate into a culture that may not fit their spiritual needs. And it's a real shame that these cultural and spiritual traditions in hoodoo are not being taught and practiced as regularly as they used to be. But I don't think that's specific to hoodoo. I think you can look across the world and see that kind of slowly deteriorating in many cultures. And I understand that cultures evolve just like any other organism, but at some point we should collectively take a step back and ask ourselves if this isn't maybe devolution as opposed to evolution. I think an argument can also be made that slavery never ended in this country and was just extended from one race of people to include everyone. But that's an argument to be made another day. On a personal note, I would like to point out that the growth of the show has pleasantly surprised me to this point, and I'd love it if you helped me reach even more listeners. I'm a one-man gang here, and I can only do so much, so it'd mean quite a bit to me if you dropped the show a good rating on iTunes if you use that platform, or if you followed and shared the show on social media, or on Twitter and Instagram mainly. Twitter is at OCulturePod, and Instagram is at Oculture underscore podcast. You can also find the show on Facebook, Snapchat, Tumblr, and Pinterest, all of which are linked in the show notes. Anyway, that's it for this one. Thank you guys for sticking around and spending your time with me. You've been listening to Oculture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Oh.